Web servers. Yes, web servers. It can do web servers. Obviously, nobody cares because you don't actually want to write a web server. You want to use a web framework. We have those. Okay, but I don't make them. Other people make them, and they give talks too. Hello, my name's Mike. I wanted to give you a quick intro to sales.js, and I'm going to try to keep it under five minutes, but we'll, do, we'll see what happens. So Sales is an MVC framework for Node, and uh, it does a lot of the things that Ruby on Rails does for you um, in, in trying to keep to the same pattern when possible, but it does it typically with a more data-driven kind of modern flavor. So this is good for like single page web apps, um, or if you're making a native mobile app or an app for something like a, a wristwatch. So without further ado, let's let's make some stuff. So let's make a new app. And I already have sales installed here. So we'll call the new app demo. And I just made a little folder for me called demo. And I go in and I see there's my app. So just a, a quick getting started. Let's go ahead and fire that up. And then we can check it out. It says it's running on, okay, 1337, right? That's the default. So there we go. There's our new sales app. Um, you know, this is based on Express with a little help from Socket.io, which we'll get to in a little bit. What this is doing is serving a layout using EJS templates for view partials and giving us this homepage. Very basic. So we're going to use this tool again, and we're going to say sales generate model user. So what this is, is very much like a classic MVC model, except instead of doing something like creating a HTML scaffold for me, this is going to create a JSON API that I can use. And the reason for that is that I can't really use Rails scaffolds in production, but I can use this JSON API in production um, because it's simple. So let's try some stuff out. I can make a user, and I already have a few in here. Let's try Lisa, Mark, Tim, and Cindy. So I just pass that name as a, a request parameter. And I can also send, I can post some JSON here as well. And I can actually post JSON to user. Um, and the reason why we did it that way is so that it maps exactly to what you're expecting from a backbone app on the front end. Since that's, we, per, you know, my company does a lot of that stuff and uh, other folks seem to like to do that as well. So, right, let's try some other stuff. Let's change, uh, let, let's just give Lisa a email address. Okay. And it looks like what I did is I actually gave her a attribute named Lisa at balder-co instead of giving her a real email address. So let's try that. There we go. This is why sometimes it's better to do this as posted JSON. And let's actually try that here. So if I post some JSON to find all, I, I really can't post it to user because that would create based on backbone conventions. Um, if I post to find all, I get a list of all my users. and Let's say I want to do something a little bit more complex now. I wanted to uh, paginate that list. So let's, uh, oh, let's wrap our things in quotes. So let's set a limit of three here. Okay, and so it's showing me the first three users. I can also do this here in the browser by passing a request parameter like that. Great. So what else can I do? Well, I can sort these guys. So let's see, I want uh, to go from Z to A instead of uh, in order of IDs here. So I'm going to say sort name descending. And now I've got Tim, Mark, then Lisa. Cool. So I can also do skip for pagination, but let's talk about some of the other cool stuff. Um, a lot of times with these APIs, you want to be able to search for stuff, right? So let's try searching for people who have an A in their name. So we'll check to see if uh, name contains A. And turns out, Two folks have an A in their name here, Lisa and Mark. 
So what if what about one of those uh, kind of silly A to Z pickers, right? Where the people still like for some reason. So we can use starts with to do that, and we can see you know whose name starts with an L. Well, that's Lisa. Okay, so that's kind of a rough idea of what you can do there. Let's talk about the other stuff really quick. The other thing that Sales does, which is kind of neat, um, is we can access the same API over WebSockets. So Sales bundles this version of Socket.io, which is almost untouched. It just adds one simple method, um, and I'll show you that method. So we're going to connect to the local host. And, and we're going to say, OK, um, let's do a, let's actually save that so we can access it. Let's do a request to slash user and see what we get. And this is set up so it has the same API as jQuery, Ajax. So there we go, cool. We have four users, and it turns out these are actually exactly the same as what was in our API over HTTP. And the way that Sales does this is it maps those um, socket.io requests to express requests automatically for you. Cool. So let's do something uh, more exciting there. So let's if we go into this assets folder, we have you can see that there's you know JavaScript mixins, styles, and templates. And what Sales is going to do is automatically parse all of these things and bring them into our page for us to our layout. So we're going to make a new test JavaScript file. And I'm just copying what we wrote in the console there. So I'm connecting over the socket. Um, this is just standard socket IO stuff. I'm going to listen on that socket for when the connection occurs. And then once that happens, I'll go ahead and request that list of users. So one of the other nice things about these API scaffolds is they, they abstract some of the real-time pub sub stuff for you that you might want to be using. So because I've found all these users now, uh, Sales has created a subscription for all of them for me. So I can now listen uh, for messages, and I'll put them in. Let's just kind of see what we get here. OK. Oh, and I forgot to start the server. OK. So you can see in, in both these browsers, I'm, I'm getting a list of these four objects because it's happening right at the page load. But I wonder what will happen if I create a user via the API. We can see this connected socket over here actually got a message letting it know that I created a user. And that's actually uh, something that is true for all connected sockets, right? So it's broadcasting it using these dynamic rooms it creates for the models. And you can see how this would be useful for stuff like chat or real-time dashboards or online games. And keep in mind, this is without writing any code so far. Great. So how do we secure this stuff, right? Um, that was one of the biggest questions people had about Meteor, and with good reason. So to do that, we can look in this config folder, and there's this file called policies.js. And because we are doing everything in sort of what I would call the right way, um, with this RESTful JSON API, we actually have uh, control over who can access which endpoints right out of the box. So the default policy here is true, and that means we're going to let just about, we're going to let anybody do anything. Well, that's not quite what we want. So let's set up that the uh, the user controller, which you know doesn't actually exist right now. We're, we're using a scaffold for this, but we can still do it this way. Let's say that the user controller, we want to allow people to read these users, but only certain people should be able to uh, write to them to do, you know, add new users, update them, and delete them. So using a star here covers everything else except the things after it. Um, and let's do, let's have a policy called authenticated. And then let's go ahead and allow find all to go through. And, and find all is how we indicate uh, that action of, of grabbing all the users. And we'll allow people to find individual users as well. 
So that authenticated here actually refers to a folder called policies in your, in your API subdirectory. And I can make a policy file called authenticated. And this is actually just express middleware now. So we write what we're used to here, if you've ever used express before. And if not, no big deal. It's, just, it's pretty simple. It's a great, uh, great library. So we'll just check and see if the session has an authenticated flag set. And if it does, we're going to go ahead and let this person through. Otherwise, we're going to just send back a dumb 403. OK, so let's see what happens. Now if I fire this guy up and let's check out his console, right? So he actually, so it's forbidden right now. And the reason for that is because I forgot to explicitly handle the index case because I'm actually just hitting slash user directly. So we want to go ahead and allow index through. That's fine. And I need to restart my server anytime I make changes. Okay, so now there's my giant list of, of users. Let's see what happens uh, when I try to create a new user now. I'm forbidden, right? So I'm, I'm getting stopped from doing it until I have something in my session that says, yes, you are authenticated. And we don't need to build that right now. I think we know how to do that. So last thing, let's take this guy and put it on uh, a joint smart OS server in production. So. Rather than copying this stuff over right now, I'm actually just going to recreate it since we really didn't write a whole lot of code here. So let's grab this IP address and uh, SSH on. And I'm going to install sales really quick. I just do sudo npm install dash g sales. All right, it's done. So let's run through the steps we did before again. Let's make a new project called demo. We'll CD into it. We'll generate a model called user. And now we're really ready to go, but we want to do three things here. We want to put this thing in production mode, which is going to set its internal Express.js and socket.io server to be in production mode. Drop this into port 80 and install a MySQL on the server or use an external MySQL so that we have something more stable than just this you know, development only dirty database that we're storing these users in. So let's start with that one because it's the most complicated, uh, but shouldn't be too bad. So we need to install an adapter. So in this case, for sales, uh, the MySQL adapter is called waterline-mysql. So that's good to go. Let's, let's go check out our config folder. And you can see we have this uh, adapters.js file. And in here, you can see the default is set to disk. And disk, if you look a bit further down, is actually using this waterline dirty module. So let's switch this to use MySQL. And I'm just going to use a, a MySQL that I have installed on another server, rather than putting one on here right now. So this is on a server. I design it for that us. And the MySQL user is tests, and the password is abc123, and the database is test. So now we've got MySQL. Let's go in and change our port. So that's in application.js. And you can see we have some other config here as well. But what matters right now is let's get on port 80 and let's get this environment changed to production. OK, I think we're good to go. So we're going to run sales lift. You can see it's compiling the stuff from the rigging path uh, in order for us and then turning it into minify JavaScript and CSS files. And then it starts the server on port 80 in production mode. So let's see if it works. Awesome. So there we are. And there's our API that we created. And that's it. If you like sales and you want to grab it, play with it, do some cool stuff, it's sudo npm install dash g sales. And finally, if you check out salesjs.com, you'll find our documentation and our IRC channel. So if you're stuck and you need to talk to somebody, someone's usually online, and feel free to hit us up. Thanks for your time.